Your storyline or plot is how your audience gets to see your world. It's the train that drives through what you've created and lets us see what you've made. Of course, the track needs to be built correctly, or the train is going to derail and we're all going to die. I'm DC Ferguson, author of the Wicked Instruments series, and this is 5 Pitfalls in Storylines. I created this series for a damn good reason, and that's because world building is hard. You don't make Westeros in a single day, but you also can't be a slave to the world you've created. It doesn't matter how beautiful, rich, historical, or well-mapped your world is, if you've put it on a pedestal above telling a good story, you've done yourself a disservice. So here's where this rule gets broken. The Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now, before you grab your pitchforks and torches, I'll say that this is a classic, and it deserves to be. I'll also say that almost none of us are going to be J.R. Tolkien, and you should never try to duplicate Middle-Earth. It's sacred ground, and there's probably never going to be another one. That said, let's take a peek with a critical eye. The world of Middle-Earth isn't just fleshed out, it's a flesh monster. The maps, the history, the fully developed elvish language, the problem is just that. When the story is over, there's so much meat left on the bone you could open a Middle-Earth buffet. The films exacerbate this problem, they're almost like a museum. There's so much to take in that we spend a lot of the movie looking at set pieces in awe and wonder. We're so busy giving out oohs and ahs, we're not really following the narrative. And that's another issue in and of itself. Tolkien has such a rich history built into this world, it can be an absolute chore to keep up with. And then there's the other issue, which is the story, while a modern classic, does have a certain fairy tale element to it. For all of Middle-earth's grandeur, the plot can be boiled down to that one time the Fellowship saved the entire world from evil and everyone lived happily ever after. For such a complex and rich world, the ending is so compacted and neat. Still, it's a great series, a must-read, and the guiding light for every fantasy that came after it. There is a sacred bond between you and your audience. They've given in to you to shape a world for them to escape in for a little while. So, if you make a promise to your audience, you damn sure have to keep it. This promise is the concept of uh, Chekhov's gun. If you show us a gun, then that gun must go off later. So, examples of Chekhov's gun can sometimes be very specific, like warning not to cross the streams, to very, very broad, like an entire to story told to us in flashback. So, let's look at Memento as an insanely well-done piece of film, and the fact that it's a story-crafting nightmare if you're the poor bastard writing it. It stands on one premise. The first scenes you see are the end of the film. The entire movie is working backwards to understand what you've seen. The promise is that the end of the film will make you understand the beginning, and it delivers in spades. You complete the loop here, hit the plot twist, and then you reach your climax. Now, let's look at these somber folks. The opening of Final Fantasy X feels like a dark cloud hangs over the impending heroes as they rush to the finale. It sets a tone that is bleak, puts weight on the impending end of the narrative. Now. Let's fly this right off the rails. The story follows Titus, a boy that's going to be our primary hero, but he decides to join a party in a supporting role of this girl Yuna here. Now, if you've watched my previous video on supporting characters, you already know we just broke a rule here and made our intended protagonist a supporting character, but I digress. This beautiful summoner must make a pilgrimage across the world, gathering power in the form of Eidolons, or super magic creatures. They're going to battle Sin, a giant world-swallowing monster. The twist is that every summoner chosen to do this has succeeded, but only at the cost of their life, and eventually Sin will return. So Yuna's victory ensures her death, and this sacrifice doesn't sit well with Titus, who is falling for her. Through a winding and explosive narrative, we're finally brought back to our opening scene. The promise has been fulfilled, and we can all sit back for that bittersweet climax. Except we can't. This Chekhov's gun suffers from premature release, and it goes off at the end of the second act, leaving an entire third act to jump through one more plot twist after one more plot twist, until the expected outcome isn't the outcome that happens at all, and the ending you're left with has absolutely nothing to do with the sacred promise that was made in the first five minutes of the game. It smacks of not knowing how to end a story correctly with your promise and tacking on a bunch of rubbish to explain the ending that you did come up with. If you've been following my series, you might recall me mentioning the safe place several times. 
Uh, you might also remember that it's a rule our characters can't stay there. The reason is that there's no change or growth. When the siege against the castle begins, no matter whose side is the victor, we want to see a new face in the castle when it's over. When we fly up into space, we're wanting to move the unmovable object or die trying. The point is, we want to follow where the greatest change is taking place, because that's where our heroes are made, in the fires of transformation. So, let's talk about what a safe place is, and what it isn't. So, let's take a look at War of the Worlds. This film follows the very human story of a single father trying to keep his family uh, safe in the midst of a seemingly unbeatable alien force as they invade Earth. The main character starts on Earth, the battleground is Earth, when the battle is over, Earth is saved, and the family is safe on Earth. So, other than a massive cleanup and stories about, you know, remember that one time aliens invaded and they died to the common cold, there's no change. The dad still has two kids to raise on Earth, same as where we started from. The whole story ends where it began. No one considers it an epic story when you talked your way out of a traffic ticket, because it starts and ends the same. Talk about how the cop pulling you over suddenly needed you to help him foil a bank robbery, and then all of a sudden you're on the news. Now, here's an example of what it's not, and this is an important distinction. Take a look at Night of the Living Dead. The father of the modern zombie film, George Romero, also liked making strong political statements using the zombies as a metaphor. So what's unique here is we follow a group of strangers that all take refuge in the same house trying to survive the night as zombies close in on all sides. 90% of this film takes place inside the house while holding off the invasion. So how is this not like War of the Worlds? Well, because the zombies aren't the problem. The battleground isn't outside on the porch. It's amongst the people inside the house. War is being waged between the conflicting personalities and the motivations of the characters. And our main character, Barbara, goes from being a terrified victim to the sole survivor through courage and force of will. She undergoes all of her change inside the house. It's a study of the human condition. It's not too shabby for a low-budget B-movie, if you ask me. So, you've got your concept for a world that's the coolest, most original, and badass world ever made. The only thing is, in order for the rules of your world to work, you've got to explain it to me for 20 minutes. Or, worse yet, you understand that there's things in your world that just defy common sense and kind of sweep those under the rug. That's not to say you have to be so detailed in your world building as to prepare for every possible scenario, but if you miss the basics like food, or water, Chances are, you need to reassess your world. The thing is, is that with this one, there are countless good examples of this. Um, and some of them just absolutely fall apart under the microscope. I mean, why does the Hunger Games need to happen? What purpose does it serve? Why would the entire population of North America tune in and cheer for children murdering each other? What society would stand for this? Who was this guy that came up with the idea to go to the evil ruler of the capital and explain, hey, let's do a lottery across all of North America, randomly pluck children from their families, bring them to an expensive training facility, and then make them kill each other on television so everyone watching will be distracted and won't realize we're evil? I mean, that guy really should be fired because it's a dumb idea and it won't work. Um, here's a train wreck called Sucker Punch. So check this out. We're going to break a promise and we're going to do some mental gymnastics. First, the trailers show this awesome promise of a live-action anime movie with steampunk and katana-wielding badass girls versus Nazis and mechs. Sign me up, right? But then we find out that our character Baby Doll was committed to an insane asylum in the 1960s, and her only hope of escape lies in four items she must get from the guards, while doing sexy burlesque dances and cool anime stuff is just in her mind while she's playing pretend. Yeah, it's that bad. It also broke another rule. So, a machine randomly picks up R2. Little Anakin Skywalker goes into the exact same ship, takes off into space. He flies to a Trade Federation mothership, tries spinning because, and I quote, that's a cool trick, accidentally flies inside the mothership, tries out the cannons, happens to hit the core, and then gets bored and flies out of it to safety as the chain reaction destroys the entire mothership and saves the planet entirely by coincidence and accident. Whether you're insulting common sense, gender, or race, any offense to an audience's senses will make them think about the real world. And the real world isn't your world. 
So you can have strong, even controversial themes like sexuality and gender or race as long as they're handled with some intelligence and grace. Done well, you can even play with this to comedic effect, such as Priestess Trixie's ridiculously bigoted comments regarding halflings and the singer in the charlatan, um, which always put her in a negative light to anyone that hears her speak. Talk to your audience like adults, and they'll accept your world and story, then walk away to contemplate deeper meaning and symbolism. Challenge them intellectually, but never go all ham-fisted with a giant caricature whose presence is so insipid that you, instead of getting your cheap laughs, you get groans and annoyance. There's no long-winded examples here, because this should be pretty obvious. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. This was a public service announcement. You're welcome. The world you create for your stories is a beautiful thing. No matter how rich and deep your world and its history, though, it's only ever as good as you present it. Avoiding these pitfalls will give your world a chance to unfold before your audience's eyes, and that right there is the magic we all want to happen. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos, and as always, I'm DC Ferguson for the Art of the Arcane blog. Have fun and get crafting.